Well, hello and welcome to episode two of the Dr. Sill podcast. In this episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing Julie and Jim. Julie Symes Phillips is a registrar in psychiatry working in the same service as me. And Jim is her partner who um, joined in at the last minute and both of them have completed um, their education at the Royal Military College of Duntroon uh, and served the military full time, but have left full time service now, uh, both as majors. This was a a fascinating discussion around adverse childhood events and how that relates to service in the military. But as usual, we uh, got a little bit sidetracked and, and we were reflecting on, you know, what the general public could learn from the military and what healthcare can learn from the military. We also touched on um, the challenges of raising kids with modern technology and, and talked about how that affects resilience and development. So it was a lovely discussion covering not only military content, but also developmental psychology and, and culture cultural issues as well. But before we begin, an important disclaimer. So it's important to remember that Julie, Jim and myself are doing this podcast in a personal capacity. We are not representing any professional body, whether that be a military organization like the DVA or Open Arms or the Australian Defense Force, whether that be any medical college, um, any workplace that we've worked at or are working at. We're not representing any of those. These are our personal views. Further, any advice we talk about here is general in nature. It does not replace you seeking personalized medical advice if that's what you need. And finally, engaging in this content is wonderful, but it does not constitute a patient-doctor relationship. All right, now that's out of the way, let's get into the episode. So Julie and Jim, thank you very much uh, for joining today. It's a really interesting subject, which I'll have to admit I know very little about adverse childhood experiences and events and how that relates to service in the Australian Defence Force. Um, Julie, thank you for joining. Jim, you're, you're a last minute addition, which is great. Yeah, blowing. Yeah, blowing. Uh, this morning, Julie uh, just thought it'd be a good idea to, to get Jim in. Maybe we can start by learning a little bit about your backgrounds. Yeah, so Sounds Julie, good. what's your background? Uh, so, Sylv, I'm, uh, as you know, right at the end of my training after a very uh, lengthy, uh, lots of disruptions uh, psych reg training. The background of that is um, my um, medical sponsorship was through the Australian Defence Force. So I was in the Army before I did medicine. Oh, right. And uh, I came back from my uh, deployment overseas, just a little bit restless and sort of started thinking about what I wanted to do longer term. And that led me to applying for GAMSAT and then applying for medicine. I was going to train as a GP, which at the time in the military was the specialties they were uh, sponsoring through. But when I started doing my return of service back um, at the time, I was posted to Inogra, which is up in uh, Brisbane mm. and is one of the larger field force units with uh, housing, I think, six brigade is still there, love. Yep. Uh, just found it was in that background of uh, the two battalions up there, 6RAR and 8 9 RR at the time, had a lot of uh, people coming back from Afghanistan, really unsettled. There'd been uh, the green on blue attacks, there'd been some deaths uh, of our service people and people coming into the RAP or the Regimental Aid Post, which is sort of like a generic walk-in clinic slash acute presentations that's uh, run Monday to Friday in the big bases and people just sort of come in and there was a lot of mental health coming through the door and mental health presenting as physical complaints, poor sleep, back pain that wouldn't mm. resolve. So quite somatic and that got me interested in mental health and so eventually found our way to Canberra and here we are. Wow, thank you. for. <laughs> so at the moment, you're, um, you've finished the psychiatry registrar training time. Yes. And, but still working as a registrar. Yes. Uh, okay, and on sick relief today. So if the phones Correct. go off, yes. uh, <laughs> that's, we'll, we'll understand that. Um, and Jim, can you tell me a bit about your background? Um, yeah, I did six years at university when it was free. Oh, nice. And did, uh, did social work and arts and psychology and then decided not to really use any of that and joined the army. <laughs> Um, and uh, went to infantry. So I went to Duntroon, then to infantry. And then eventually I uh, found my way over to SAS over in Perth and spent um, a bit of time over there. I was a troop commander there, then I came back, then I came back as a squadron commander. Um, so I was, I think, 15 years in the army all up. 
and then uh, we were getting together about then so and, and I thought it was time to get out so I got out and became a project manager so uh, lucky enough to work in some you know some interesting spaces I worked in the Olympics a few Olympics oh wow Rugby World Cup, World Swimming Championships, that sort of stuff. Big so events. just more of an adventure, really, than anything else. Then, uh, then we found ourselves back in Canberra, which is you know, 13 years ago. Mm. Wow. Yeah. What, is, what a story. And so you've both had your own independent experience with the Australian Defence Force. That's right. And you yeah. both started not from a mental health perspective. You Correct. kind of discovered mm. your interest in mental health through the Australian Defence Force. Is that a fair Yeah, that's summary? a fair comment. And I think over the years, um, and Jim will speak more about this, but we've both lost a lot of friends, good people, um, to unexpected deaths, either by suicide or by accidents. Um, the Blackhawk um, uh, disaster, which was the largest loss of life for the ADF and the training accident, I'll, I'll let you speak a bit more about that, Jim, you know, really impacted us, I suppose, in our 20s and 30s. And then... As we sort of grew up, I suppose, in both in service and in our own life trajectory, seeing that impact roll on to um, to persist in people and also to affect their children. And, of course, that just sort of ties in with what we do in our training in terms of understanding um, how ACEs, how adverse childhood experiences continue to impact people through their life. Wow. Mm. I've, I have a couple of friends who serve and I'm always profoundly affected by just how their demeanor changes they, they almost have like a civilian face on yeah. a lot of the time and then when they refer to the reality of what we're protected from as civilians and what they have to endure and experience you just see this change in their demeanor and, and it's it's a whole nother world that a lot of us don't really get um so it must have been yeah pretty profound what happened with the black hawk oh, in 12th of june 1996 um there was a, a counter-terrorist exercise in Townsville, or just outside of Townsville, the high range training area, and um, two Blackhawks flew into each other, and um, 15 people from SAS died, and three aviators died, the two pilots and, uh, and a loadmaster. And, um, and as a result, and that's a, a, I mean, that was, had a profound effect on the unit, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fifth, you know, burying 15 people from the regiment and three others, obviously, fr from the aviators. But uh, I think the key thing there was it was the first time that a significant amount of trauma since the um, the Navy had an accident where the aircraft carrier crashed and I think it was the Sydney or whatever it was called. So it was the biggest loss of life in a long time. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the, the effect on the families was significant. And you also commented on a kind of intergenerational effect as well, how it affects the, the children of these people and how it affects parenting. So maybe that's a good lead in to talk a bit about um, childhood experiences. Yeah, like, and, and in terms of ACEs, and it's sort of a term that gets bandied around and certainly in our training and, and by anyone who works in mental health. And ACEs, so ACE, adverse? Adverse childhood experiences. Okay. And the term actually came around um, in the 1990s. There was a uh, big insurer, I think it was, um, I can't remember the name of the insurer, but somewhere in America, they actually surveyed about 17,000 people, so one seven thousand people, and they were trying to understand the impact of childhood trauma on adult health issues. So it wasn't about specifically mental health, it was just about health generals per se. And at the time, that was really cutting edge. I mean, in, in our area of training, we sort of, it, it, you know, everyone's quite aware of that impact on um, inflammation, chronic disease, uh, you know, insomnia, mental health, higher rates of incarceration. Everyone gets that now. But at the time, these were quite sort of radical findings. And they came up with this sort of pyramid of um, of ACEs and they kind of use that as a working model and there's been a bunch of studies that have occurred since then and I think the thing that's really interesting is um, in Australia James Scott has um, there's been a huge push by him he's put together an amazing team looking at the childhood maltreatment study and the results of that got released in 2023 so it's a similar concept but looking at an Australian only audience and they um, did a cross-sectional randomised computer generated mobile phone numbers of about 8,000 people around Australia so it was meant to be very representative of the typical Australian population mm. there, there's a separate paper about how they got those people surveyed 
So very Australia specific. And the results of that are, are, are appalling. You know, the rates of sort of childhood um, experiences that that uh, show how widespread maltreatment is. And, and we're talking over 60% of people surveyed. And they actually broke up the sort of experiences. So they looked at uh, exposure to domestic violence. Mm. They looked at neglect. They looked at um, sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a freely accessed study. If anyone's interested, I really encourage you to have a look at that. And also for, for anyone training in, in um, anything to do with mental health or even health, really, because the findings of it are really sobering, that there's so many people out there who um, have directly been influenced. And it's much more broad broad much more widespread than i think anyone really expected that's i mean i think i was aware of the numbers but i haven't sat with actually reflecting on it it's um, worthwhile more than half yeah of people and yeah I, I had this i'm fortunate enough to like i to, i don't feel like i've had a particularly traumatic life and so i was naive to how ubiquitous trauma is and i just kind of felt like being in these major cities of spent a lot of time in Sydney and Canberra. Mm. Being in these major cities, I, I would have thought, oh, you know, it's more something in poorly developed areas or something like that. That's probably the stigma I had, but it's it's everywhere. The, the, the findings of the study was basically, it was designed to be kind of a functional cross-section of society. So these were people who were working, people had their own mortgages. Mm. Uh, you know, it wasn't that, uh, I suppose, front loading of people we tend to see in public health who have uh, really struggled and maybe especially at the moment with cost of living and those sort of pressures financially don't have access to, to getting good services so this was sort of meant to be a cross-section of normal Australians and yeah the the, the results are staggering mm. and um, certainly so I, I, I suspect that means you know if it's 60% of the general population that's also very suggestive that 60% or if not more possibly they would would be found in the ADF um, employees and, and, yeah. and workers. Yeah, I, I spent a chunk of time working in the um, recruiting space, which I, again oh. I really enjoyed, and that was looking at people coming into defence in any kind of capacity, and the, the and defence does a lot of work in pre-screening its employers because you're really looking for that healthy soldier effect, that implication of the healthy worker effect, that being employed is in of itself conducive to good health and by pre-screening the population you're potentially making sure that anyone coming in and serving because you know you're going to be exposing people um, potentially you know there's things like battle inoculation and there's um, a lot of work and pre and post deployment screening to make sure people have got that good occupational health support. So uh, what's this term battle inoculation? Uh, th there's one of the things that you, you really do need to do, especially for um, you know people who are likely to get into, I suppose, you know, a, a battle or a warlike situation, is you, you absolutely need to provide them with an environment in which they know what that may be like. Right. You know, so whether, and you can achieve that in many ways. You know, you can achieve it through, you know, li literally live fire practices where they have that going the whole time, where they are exposed to explosions going around them in a very controlled, safe training environment. Okay. Regulation. Yeah, I think um, I'm familiar with some scenes from movies w yeah, which would have been called battle inoculation, where yeah. they're it's shooting a bit like rounds in above the, yeah. soldiers as they're yeah. getting yeah, cold and muddy. It's a bit like in medicine where we're trying to simulate right. a, a um, adverse high stress environment um, and make sure people have got, um, I suppose, roadmaps of what to do. You know, um, a good example is with weapon stoppages. Yeah. We, we do it a bit safer in Australia than other countries. Oh, really? We're in Indonesia once, we're over there, and uh, they, have, they call it the Doppler range, and they literally fire live rounds, you know, to the sides, over your head and everything as you're doing it. We'd never do that in Australia because, obviously, that's you know, the safety. Too risky. Yeah, too, too risky, yeah. 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 Mm. And I think... So um, that's part of the pre-screening process and things that you were talking about? No, the pre-screening process, that's once someone's in and serving. Oh, yeah, that's the re-serving, yeah. Yeah, but um, the pre-screening's process is really about exploring someone's childhood and getting them to talk about their health and there's a psychological screening aspect as well as a, a medical officer um, performing a review. But I think the thing that I found really interesting is that um, 
knowing how widespread exposure to difficult experiences is, is how many people don't think of what they've been through as being in any way difficult because your home life and your upbringing is what it is. You know, it's not something that necessarily a lot of people have thought about in great detail unless there's been, you know, significant adversity. So I think what happens is a lot of people coming into uh, defence, one of the things um, Jim and I have always loved about being in uniform is it's such an egalitarian organisation. You know, it doesn't matter what your postcode is, doesn't matter what school you went to, doesn't matter what your mum and dad's story is. It's about you being competent and capable on the ground. Do, do you think that with that, if, if we accept that there's a dropping in resilience in the general community, the issue now is that people are reflecting differently upon their experiences. So, so they're lowering the bar for what's adverse. I don't think so, because one of the things that came out with this childhood study was that over half of people surveyed had never disclosed their experiences to anyone else. They'd never talked about it to their GP. Their partners didn't know about their, their experiences. You know, um, if you think about the highest rate of exposure, there was something like nearly 40% of people reported having exposure to domestic violence within the home. Now, this is something that's not going to come up in your workplace conversations or, you know, parent-teacher interviews. You know, there's these... So I don't think it's about a greater awareness. It's just that... There's still a lot of shame. There's still a lot of stigma. There's still a lot of things that happen behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah, that's my sense as well. So, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind hearing this is, um, say I'm a soldier, I, well, I want to be a soldier, mm. and I'm getting screened by mm. a psychologist, psychiatrist, or a medical officer, and they mm. start asking me these questions. But I want to be a soldier. I'm not going to start talking about my vulnerabilities. <laughs> what are you that's thinking, a, Julie? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, um, you know, obviously um, part of the, the change has been people, are, and especially young people, are much more likely to talk about uh, their issues around mental health. And that absolutely in a pre-employment screening review um, will be marked as, right. as, a, as a yellow flag and would be further explored. And I think um, one of the things that's interesting when we do our child and adolescent rotations has been very careful about diagnoses. You know, this is a young person who's still evolving, their mm -hmm. personality is still evolving. I think there's massive stigmatisation that we're creating if we pre-label someone before we're letting them explore who they are and um, trying to find out a way forward for them to, to keep developing their character and their personality. So absolutely, if they, if something is flagged, and, and this is not defence specific, if you yeah. um, seek employment in the police forces, if you seek employment, I, I imagine as any kind of first responder in areas where we know at an organisational level that we're going to be exposing people potentially to harm's way, yeah, of course you want to know if someone's trauma bucket is already yeah overflowing um, because I we know we're going to put too. things into that trauma bucket as you go through yeah. your, your professional life that's a nice way to think about it as a bucket mm. and everyone has a different sized bucket and yeah. that kind of thing can overflow because I, I remember speaking to a pilot once who um just explained how there's so much waiting against like there's so much going against being open about one's mental health as a pilot yeah. because you can lose your wings so easily yeah um which is a paradox because maybe being more open would have made them safer in ways. It is and, and tricky. There's no yeah easy answer to it. But there's so, no easy sometimes answer. Sometimes you've actually been surprised by the amount people share where you'd think, you know... Yeah, you that? shouldn't be telling me this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think that's an important thing to remember is that it's not about, um, you know, letting someone in or out. It's about making sure if we find the right place for what we can manage. That's is so that true. You to want to be a square it? peg in a square hole. And in yeah. any large organisation, be it the military, be it public health, you know, these are large, massive bureaucracies. These are big ships to turn around. And it's no one's fault. It's not about you as an individual, but you, it, these systems you are joining, you know, you're getting good pay and good conditions for a reason. You know, you need to look around and say, is this right for me? And not everyone has the ability to reflect on that because they may be trying to get out of a bad situation and that's why they're hitching their brooch. I mean, certainly for me, um, defence was a fantastic experience. It was a, a reattachment experience. It, it's a reparenting experience. And I think um, in terms of your earlier question about 
you know, is defence a, a standard cross section of the population? I think that's a really interesting conversation, mm. and and it's not something I've ever researched. And I'm sure defence has, has got research around this somewhere um, about people join defence. Why would you choose to be a soldier? Why would you choose to put on a uniform? Why would you choose to go, especially an army? I mean, Jim and I are very green focused, and and the ADF is very tribal, a bit like medicine, you know. So. Um, you know, so does that expression "we're very green focused" mean you're very army specific correct. in your experience? Right, right. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and and the ADF in terms of size and structure, you know, we're, we're talking about um, you know nearly sixty thousand full time serving people, about another thirty thousand part active part time reservists. So you know, it, it, it's eighty ninety thousand people all up, mm. and there's. And the tail end in the community, there's a bunch of people um, who were referred to as veterans who um, have served. And I think what's that sitting at? Probably oh, yeah, a I'd couple hundred thousand. Guess. Yeah, and and in uniform, you're looked after by um, the military's health and occupational um, health structures. Once you're out of uniform, you're looked after by DVA, Department of Veterans Affairs. Now, DVA in itself is a massive organisation with a lot of people working for it and a big budget. Um, they've recently appointed their first ever chief psychiatry officer. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, first ever. John Lane, terrific fellow. Um, he himself is a veteran. And he, uh, part of his rationale, I suppose, and I'm speaking on behalf of John here, but he's also worked with Open Arms who look after families and also um, individual serving members post-service as well, but more from a mental health perspective. So so veterans are well looked after in the community. Uh, the issue is about accessing support and being able to acknowledge that someone needs support. Um, the definition of veteran has evolved over the years. There was a um, big inquiry after the death of Jesse Bird, who was a um, young man who spent about 18 months, was really struggling, family were really struggling um, to help support him and let him access the help that he needed from a mental health perspective. And um, he ended up taking his life. And uh, a lot of changes came through with DVA after that. And they brought in a very generous definition for veteran for accessing mental health so it's after 24 hours of service any service in terms of doesn't have to be deployed service like as in you've just gone to kapuka you then qualify for being a veteran under non-liability non mental health care so you're able to access psychology psychiatry any mental health support so it's very generous because mm. a lot of people hear about a lot of frustrations about department of veterans affairs and, and delivery of service and I think from my perspective, the best way to look upon it, it's a truly world-class product. I mean, the, the, on paper, what you can access, but it's just the delivery, you know, it's delivered in a massive public service environment. And that's what mm. I think is really the nub of why people have issues. But the product itself, what you can have access to, what you can get to, the amount of money we spend is, is, is good. So, you know, it, it's, it's a good product. It's just that it's delivered by right. a very cumbersome public service. Right. Julie, you mentioned, and I'm interested to get your reflections as well, Jim, around how joining the service was a reattaching, reparenting experience for you. Can you talk to that at all? Yeah, and I think... It's an interesting, um, interesting to hear that. I, I think that's the same, um, that's true for a lot of people who join Defence, and I think a lot of the... Um, issues around PTSD and the PTSD rates, which we know are higher for the military population, um, is around that early developmental, early childhood experiences leading to you in your late teens, early 20s, maybe sort of seeking a, a, another space, mm. seeking to be away from where you grew up. And Defence is fantastic at providing that. You know, it'll, it'll clothe you, it'll move you around the country, it pays you on a regular basis, it you looks after your, your teeth. <laughs> yes. Oh, is that how you met? Yeah. 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 It's an occupational hazard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You'd have to disclose that one. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, so, so a lot of people who come to Defence have, I guess, um, got a little bit of messiness in their personal lives. So, As so, we all do. Yeah, but, you know, I, I think it probably is a little bit high, high okay. for the general soldier, you know, so you're used to being yelled at, you're used to being, um, you know, adversity's not 
too much of a big deal. Um, and I think part of part of the um, difficulties and transition is around that loss of family, that loss of community, that loss of structure, loss of of meaning and purpose. It it really hits people hard. And you know, I can speak for myself. Transitioning from defence, I probably still haven't quite gotten there to be honest. Um, I I really miss the environment once I was away from wow. it. And the other thing I wanted to talk about, so the Royal Commission into Defence and um, Veteran Suicide has just released 122 findings or recommendations as of August this year. Massive document, and that's going to wash through how DVA and open arms and even in service will start, I think, um, really taking note of our screening and our post-transition care. But one of the interesting um, findings out of that is that the increased rates of suicide are much more prevalent for people who've never deployed and I think that's really interesting yeah that is fascinating yeah and a little bit counterintuitive I think for the lay person but certainly we've both um, kept up with soldiers who have been quite broken from their service and it isn't deployment related it's to do with being medically broken but the rates of um, increased prevalence of suicide you know when you're looking at an age match cohort I mean for for males it's about you know 20 I think it was 29 percent higher that than oh, I've actually got the 26 percent higher than the national average but for women it was a hundred and seven percent higher for female veterans so is it something about being deployed giving a sense of purpose to life what do you is it has anyone tried to put some theories as to why the suicide rate is higher in those who have not deployed i think there's a um lot of work into understanding why that's um occurring and and this is my own personal view so this is not me trying to represent you know dva or adf or anything one of the big things that came out was the concept of administrative violence so people being bullied because they no longer complied i suppose with organizational aims and principles and if you think about defense it's such a hierarchical organization your commanding officer or whoever is in your chain of command has a massive influence on your day by day what does your workplace look like and we see that in health you know clinical leadership is something um, i get quite passionate about because you know it's a very similar environment we've got big problems scarce resources not enough people um, the need is growing and 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 there's a big gap between what is able to be delivered and then that leads to triaging and then that leads to people going without that shouldn't be going without very similar to what defense has to deal with when they're um, dealing with hearts and minds or overseas on deployments it's similar so that there's that sense of moral injury where you you know as you think about it as a doctor you're wanting to do good you're wanting to bring this person in under the umbrella of what your organization can provide but they don't quite meet criteria or they don't uh, or, or we try and push them back to their GPs to try and access a mental health care plan, even though we know there's not enough psychologists out there delivering mental health care plans. Mm. So I think the issue about is a deployment in it of itself protective? Um, Jim, I might let you talk a bit more to that. I, I think there's obviously there's clearly a lot of issues at play. What One of them, I think, is, is absolutely the reason people don't get deployed it may well be based in where they're at, you know, so it might be the physical, because many times I know, you know, jury will talk about people presenting to the regimental aid post, the hospital on on, on base at, with physical complaints, but but she clearly picks up and then after discussion, stuff comes out in the table. So so I, the, the, so I think that there is a, a, a confluence of that. Mm. And, and the other thing, of course, is, and, and you picked up on the fact that it gives you a purpose, a sense of purpose. You, you, when you're on operation, you do bond with the people in your operation. With. So, you know, uh, if, if you don't go on one, you're sort of you're probably left with the view of watching others go away and come back and get medals and pats on the back and all that. And then there's the obvious one at the back end of that, which is a reflective sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't go on anything. I was in the army for 22 years. Mm -hmm. And we've definitely known people out who've had magnificent service. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, the way, sadly, the way in which militaries measure it is often by medals and war stories, as sad as that is. And how yeah. the public measure it as well, you yeah. know. I mean, um, look at the massive spend they've just recently done on the war memorial, which is an inc incredible... Um, it, you know, it, it's an incredible organisation, but you know, there there has been at times where you you've walked into the war memorial and there's been a focus on an individual rather than 
which is sort of against the ethos of what the military is about. You know, you're part of a team. The weakest link is the weakest person in your team. Therefore, everyone gets becomes a part of the journey. You know, uh, it's it's not an individual about it, it's not about the individual. It's about how you function as a team which I guess is back to our early childhood experiences. So for I think for a lot of people coming to the uniform, the first time you really have that sense of cohesion, attachment, purpose. Family. Family yeah. is with your peers. Wow, yeah. It's powerful. Before when you were talking about the parallels between healthcare and the military, mm. I was wondering if you had... This is an impossible question, but what what do you if you know limitless budget? What do you think the healthcare system could learn from the military? Ooh, that's a good question. That is a good Take question. Take a second to think. Yeah, yeah. look, um, I think that's a really good question, Syl, because I know over the years, um, and you know, speaking again personally, it's it's easy to sit on the sidelines and be critical and see what's broken around the system, and I think sometimes we don't give enough time or imagination to saying what can we do better as in a collective we what could the system do better uh i i personally think the front loading needs to happen in a developmental trajectory perspective so yeah. if we think that there's bunches of folks out there who have had adverse childhood experiences the implication of that is you can't have an ace without an adverse parental experience. Wow, well said. You know, so I think what that means is that we have to invest in in early child care parenting um, skills. I mean, you think about driving a car, you've got to go and, you know, do a bit of theory, you've got to do some practice runs. There's you've no got to have license for having a kid. Yeah, there's no license for having a kid. And Mm. it's not fair to just sort of blame parents for getting it wrong. I mean, no parent starts out wanting to hurt or expose their child to harm. Nobody starts out like that. But the skills to keep your child safe or to allow them to prosper or or to be well-nurtured aren't necessarily going to be inherently known. So if I had an unlimited budget, I'd swap it all around. I'd pay... Child, early child care workers a fortune. I'd give um, parents as much parental leave as they wanted. Um, I would make uh, parenting skills a compulsory part of educate of the education system. Wow. Um, you know, and in fact, DVA recently have gone to tender, um, and a, which I think is absolutely fantastic and shows how invested they are and interested in our veteran families around. Um, a five-year plan to look at research in the space. And in fact, Jim, I'm at, like, you speak to about the Parenting Research Centre who uh, were one of the people who were, um, we were speaking to. Think, when, I, when I think of the DVA, I wouldn't have linked it to parenting investment. And I don't think that makes was, sense. I don't think that's really been at the forefront of their mind for a while because I've just been very reactive to, you know, what's in front of them. And, and it's been like, I suppose, the growing awareness that you've got to deal with the, the concept of networking veterans and their families as well because you know that that's often where the impact is felt as you've been talking about um so, so what they've said is we've got 25 million dollars over a five-year period to grow uh they call it the the veterans and families uh the, the, the it's like forum, yeah, um, it's it's a network of of trying to say how can we do it better how can we what's missing in research about veterans families um what's uh, what's out there so we can actually use the research that exists and, and, and make good sense of it, as well as, um, you know, what sh- sh- need do we undertake? So there's m- part of that budget is doing more research. So. Sounds like a great scholarly project. Yeah. If it... <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. So, yeah. Over you, <laughs> oh, Fortunately, <laughs> yeah. I've got mine sorted. But for yeah. those who don't know, we have um, our registrars in our co- cohort have to do a scholarly project, a literature review sometimes. And it sounds like a big part of this will be a, a big literature review. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I did wow, a... That's a um, great initiative. It is a great initiative. In fact, we were yeah. really excited when we heard about that mm-hmm. because we felt like, wow, this is the, a big organisation actually taking notice of what people are saying and I've had a very CAMS heavy um, training experience. The CAMS is Child and Adolescent, adolescent Mental, Mental Health, Health Services, Service. yeah. yeah. Um, and I think part of the reason I loved working with CAMS is um, both Jim and I have done a lot of training um, of soldiers in defence. I mean, you know, we love it's, it's a wonderful thing to be part of someone's 
I suppose, growth and, and that sense of um, getting their professionalism and their sense of competency and self-agency happening, and which is really what a lot of our CAMS kids need. But one of the things that struck me in Canberra was just how many ex-defence kids were coming through CAMS and um, either their parents were still serving or their parents were contractors um, and then you've got folks that are sort of, you know, have taken APS roles and border force or whoever and I was just astonished and I remember saying to you, love, like, gosh, you know, this is this is a real gap and it, so it was very exciting when we heard about this um DVA going sort of out to tender and, yeah. um, you know, good on your DVA. Yeah. And I think that is a luxury that we do have in the veteran community is that there is a lot of public goodwill and a lot of money is thrown towards veteran health care. Um, but what I hope is that the findings of that will be sent out to the broader community because the that child and maltreatment study, that Australian study is really frightening and really sobering and it shows you there's a big need i mean they we talk about loss of resilience in our young people see i just think that's crap i think our young people are amazing but they are the canaries in the mind if the rates of self-harming are on the increase anxiety is on the increase you know the poor little buggers a couple of years ago had nearly two years disruption with the covid lockdowns and everyone sort of expects them to be back on the horse and back to normal but the reality is it is a scary world to be growing up in with climate change and cost of living and how much it costs to get a house, all those sort of things. The, the interconnection with all of the global humans and information really feels incongruent with a developing brain. Yeah, like, yeah. It doesn't feel like a child's mind is meant to be connected to, you know, a war in, over there and the suffering over here and the, you know... W- you know, we're meant to know about 100 people evolutionarily and, and, yes. and grow in a little group. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's it's unsurprising that that's related to a huge amount of mental health effects. Exactly. So and my hope protect, is that... Uh, yeah, I don't know. If, yeah. Also, if you have any tips on how to manage that with, with, with kids, that's uh, uh-huh. be, it's probably not easy. I don't have any children, but... We're probably free from alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're probably we passionate have... about that. Like, Jim's always um, been a, a, a rugby coach or, or um, referee, and we've kept... I her, can see a, that. Yeah. <laughs> I was a halfback, not a front rower, mate. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I just meant as a coach that you'd be, I can, I can see you on the sideline. Yeah. I, I mean, we used to always sort of, um, we've, we've got a bush block. Um, we used to have um, the, the boys would bring the, the teams and whatever parents could make it. Um, sort of yeah. once a season we used to do it, didn't we? Yeah. Cool. Uh, what we found amazing out of that was, you know, there'd be kids that had never slept outside a bed in a house. You know, kids had, kids had never been to the toilet outside of a flushing toilet, you know, even a drop toilet they'd never seen in their life, you know. Um, kids had never sat around a campfire even. or So it was really eye-opening for us. To... Just so many things that the modern world makes people ignorant to. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Lighting a match. Just getting, <laughs> yeah. And, and when I think of the human form and well, the, just you know, the human organism from a bit mm. of a detached way, it, it's essentially, you know, it's a homeost. We're, we're all just trying to achieve homeostasis. Yeah, we're healthy. You have to yeah. imbalance it. Well, mate- and the dopamine is to rebalance it. And if we just engage in these modern pleasures and desires, yeah. we never get imbalanced. It's just food delivered to the door, sit on your couch, work on a computer. You're never getting uncomfortable enough. Yeah. Well, and mate, so we're, we're houseplants. We, we, need, we, need, we need a bit of sun. We need to be hydrated. We need some good nutrition once and again. And, yeah. we, and we need interaction with the environment, you know, yeah. so someone to dust our leaves, someone to chat to us. So I think, um, yeah. that, you know, I get very passionate about this, especially in our mental health space, is that circadian rhythms are so important. And we're so disruptive. We're cave people, yeah. really. These things. These things. Yeah. <laughs> Exhibit A. But what, what, what are the things you... But other... Yeah, and, but it's... Yeah, it, it's... it's it, it is very... Disru- like, culture... Uh, modern culture is disruptive but, to the circadian rhythm. That but, is a but, fair but, let, but let's segue from that. I mean, in 2021, 99% of Australian adults had mobile phone usage in Australia. 99%. Yeah. I mean, I find that stat amazing because these are powerful tools. These are a part of our day-by-day life, and especially for our young people. I mean, we've got three boys. You know, they, they are, are, are growing up with these things. They're not evil in, in of themselves, 
but they have to be managed and mustered to help you living a good life. Yeah, that should be in the education system as well. Healthy yeah. Interact, in use of technology, I'm sure it yeah. is in some way. But mm. at America, one of the things you've often talked about is, is that concept that, and this bleeds into soldiering, which is where you know, sometimes the first time a young 20-year-old, 19, 20-year-old has their heart fully going, fully pounding, they truly fear something or, or whatever, is that military experience because they haven't had it as a child of yeah. you know jumping off a roof or you know running through the bush or tripping over and having a you know um, a serious graze you know yeah. so yeah. and and for them the first time they experience that elevated heart rate is in a truly so we're massive believers in HIT, which is high intensity. Oh, I've um, got the uh, my HIT machine over there. Yeah, yeah, but but it's <laughs> so it, it's so important, and it's yeah. exactly yeah, what Jim said. If physiologically, yeah. the only time you've had an increased heart rate is because something's happening in your mind. Your poor body doesn't know what the hell to do with it, yeah. you know. And another thing I think that's really interesting in terms of the rise of diagnoses and treatment of ADHD. Well, the military is full of untreated ADHD. And, of course, it's that non-pharmacological structure which kind of keeps people going. You know, you're, you're doing battle PT at 7.30 every day. You're out bush sleeping under the stars. You're kind of... You're in rifle fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Distracted yeah, with yeah. Like rounds getting shot. Yeah, it but really there's structure. You know, you, you have... One of the things yeah, when you're training, you have, to walk, you have to walk around with a notebook and a pen. And, you know, there's that situation that's probably changed now, similar to our ISBAR called SMEAC, you know, Situation, Mission, Execution, Administration, Command, Structure, where you're formulating problems on the go all the time and letting them roll out in a practical way of delivering a solution. But, yeah. And ISBAR, just for those who don't know, is our kind of medical handover structure with um, introduction, identification, situation, background, your assessment of the situation and your recommendations for the plan moving forward. These are really helpful mnemonic. I th yeah, I think the ISBAR mnemonic came from a military origin, actually. Mm. Would have. But, but also you're experiencing, you know, in terms of mental health stuff, people experiencing success and failure. I yeah. can't do that. I learned to get over it. Or and and a structure like military actually gives you a report telling you how well you're going. Mm -hmm. You know, in a world where you know everyone gets a, a, a medal. You know, um, you know. It, I think that's you know that's the stuff that builds resilience. You know. Mm. But resilience is interesting, and I think um, I think there's a little bit of a um, habit because it's easier for us all to deal with to make resilience a subject of criticality around subgroups you know kids aren't resilient enough or parents aren't resilient enough or you know people using substances aren't resilient enough whatever because it stops us all having to have the bigger conversations about how we make a resilient community in society you know and the thing that's interesting i think about the military is that because it is a smaller snapshot of society if you can get things right in there or learn lessons from things that aren't happening well then maybe it can be expanded into broader areas like public health oh well sorry to ask julie but unlimited budget <laughs> what, what do you think what do you think civilians can learn from the military to help improve our resilience in our young ones i think one of the things is that is important to remember is you're a tiny ant in a very big machine and there's no rescue party over the horizon. So it's I think the sooner people realise it's not CAMS not being involved or the heart team not being involved or your GP not caring or whoever. Heart really, team's another mental health care team, by the way. Yep. Sorry. That's really right. the bottom line is you. The bottom line is you because one of the problems about working in mental health is they the vagueness of a lot of our formulation about what's happening for someone is what we observe or what they tell us. But really, we can't fully know as much as we try and walk hand in hand with our patients, as much as we try and empathise and understand their perspective. That meeting of minds is vulnerable. So I think the big member, big message for people out there is that you have got to not give up on you. You have got to take that first step to accessing help in some way. Now, if any of your <coughs> listeners are veterans and they don't have DVA cover or if they've got family members that don't have DVA cover, it is such an easy process these days. You go to MyGov, um, just about everyone's got MyGov these days, and you can register on MyGov for my DVA support and all you need is your date of enlistment and your regimental number. 
Now, everyone who served knows their date of enlistment or regimental number, and then DVA verify that you're a bona fide person, and then you've got access to non-liability mental health care cover. It's an incredibly generous scheme. If you're a child of a veteran, if you're a partner of a veteran, you can reach out to Open Arms. They've got a 1-800-24 hour number. These are fantastic things. I wish there was the same level of support for the civilian community. What I've seen being in public health is there's a lot of fantastic organisations out there, but it gets a little bit confusing as to who to go to. And there's waiting lists for a lot of our acute services. So if you ring Lifeline, if you ring Beyond Blue, if you ring the access team, you're not necessarily going to be able to speak to someone quickly. Ergo, we need to invest more in people having the right tools to help them get through tough times. Do you think one of the lessons we learned from the that the military model for mental health care, as, as, as Jules said earlier on, was you know a, a unit, a, you know, three hundred, four hundred person unit, like a battalion, had its organic regimental aid post, like a small GP clinic, and they actually went away from that. Mm. And I th and one of the benefits of having it organic to that unit was close knowledge by the medical staff, especially the the doctor of what's going on there. And I think that's one thing they lost. Yeah, you're, you're seen as a morale multiplier. You know, the medical staff, mm -hmm. the padres. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's a padre? Uh, like a military chaplain. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. Padre yeah, 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 gotcha. yeah. Non-denomination. Non yeah, general um, religious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, but no, and if you look upon that in the community at large, I remember as a child growing up, you had your local GP who was very accessible, who didn't even do house visits and things like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe one of the macro lessons to learn is to, you know, and I know the government keeps trying to, it's all about money, but, you know, is to, is to get those GPs closer to the communities. I don't know how you achieve that, but that's the problem set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's such a different experience when you are seeing, um, you know, a GP you've known mm -hmm. your whole life who gets you, who knew your family, yeah. who you have a, you know, uh, therapeutic rapport and connection with versus seeing a fresh GP who hasn't met you before. Oh, just seeing through the notes that you got this and that. Yeah. It's a totally yeah. different level of openness and vulnerability. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it's really, really important to um, anything in primary care. You know, I think we should go back to having school nurses, you know, across the board. And if you look at some of the fantastic structures that are in place at some of the private schools, roll it out to all of your public schools, you know. I think, um, and our experience of w watching our boys go through school is again getting back to those basics. Sometimes adding more school psychologists is not helpful, but getting the kids to run around the school oval every morning is helpful. Might save a lot of money as well. Cross countries aren't compulsory anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, e e even sort of PT or physical training, whatever they call it at school, this now it is, is not a, a given regular part of the curriculum. Yeah. And that really needs to be. And what tends to happen is it's, it's well done in primary school, but kids get to high school and they're, they're, there's so much put on to kids about choice. And, you know, so, you know, it comes down to, I suppose, again, to leadership. People need to be led, whether that's in a clinical setting, an educational setting or a health setting. People need to be led mm -hmm. and our leaders need to be well-trained and well-developed. So I think um, we're talking about unlimited budgets a lot of it. I'm making a lot of accountants very nervous <laughs> <laughs> in this podcast, but uh, yeah, unlimited budgets. Yeah, um, and I think the other way is um, looking at funding. I mean, one of the things I've found a little bit frustrating over the years is that part of the downside of non-liability for mental health care for veterans is a whole lot of folk became very interested in veteran health care who previously had zero interest in veteran health care because they knew the bills were going to be paid. And um, so I think some of the programs that have been developed in this space assume an intact frontal lobe and assume a capacity to engage in therapy, which is not necessarily there. Mm. How do you see the future of, um, of everything we've talked about moving forward, how the military is managing the, the mental health state of their soldiers and um, are you, are you worried about how things are looking going forward? or No, um... I think it's a time for optimism. I think there's a lot more awareness. Um, I think our young people are terrific. My only caveat on that would be we need to stop hyper-focusing on someone who's had maybe a bit of a messier start to life. We need to 
not make it a tool for exclusion from organisations, but as a tool for, okay, we might have a few more vulnerabilities in this space. That might mean that you have a couple of extra, bit of extra time attached to your training. Um, it's, it's incredible what responsibility and accountability can do. Yeah. Um, when you have someone who has lots of vulnerabilities um, and might not be performing you know, to the level of expectation of their supervisor or whatnot, but, but when they have good support but also accountability, you can see a new person come out of that. Yeah, and, that's and, so true. Um, and, and sometimes, it, yeah. you know, there's this, um, I forgot what the term for it is, but uh, in um, for when there is kind of like for an uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous, uh, Aboriginal, retaking this line, I just need to remember the line. So there is um, an issue with a culture of low expectations with Aboriginal people in certain organisations where um, you know, they're, they're not being held to the same standards of workers. Some of their colleagues, and maybe they're under-supported. Um, I have a close friend who works in this space and was telling me about it, but um, like obviously the work can be as good, better, or whatnot with the right supports, yeah. um, just like anyone, and, and having low expectations. So I think, um, but leading on from that point, is it really, it really is about developing self-agency. Right. And, and I think the big message for people is that you're not alone. There are supports out there, but they can be very hard to get to. So don't give up on trying to get help. Persevere. If you're lucky enough to have been a veteran, you've got a lot more life rafts out there in, in the choppy seas. We can't prescribe or give people insight, and whether that's professionally or personally in your home life, what that means is that change has to come from within. It has to come from within. So think of yourself as a house plant. If you've got dry, withered leaves, get some hydration happening. If you're failing to thrive, you need some sunshine. It, get the basics right. And if the only thing you can do is put an app on your phone that helps you to breathe or helps you get to bed on time, then that's a start. And I think that's critical. Small steps. Yeah. You know, it's a big mountain. If you look straight at the top, yeah. it's going to feel impossible. But one step at a time, little yeah. 1% wins yeah. really, help, um, really help things move forward. Yeah, I love that saying, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> Oh, one bite at a time. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a really nice place to to conclude. Um, that's just been an incredibly insightful um, conversation. I know you said you can't prescribe insight, but I feel like I just got a dose of it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, Julie and Jim, for joining. And um, I wish you all just a beautiful day, and we'll catch up. Sorry to be a blowing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, it was, uh, yeah, for those who are listening, I had about, um, th yeah, three minutes to set up a new audio source. So I hope it works out well. I have no idea what it's <laughs> going to sound like, but that'll be for me to have fun with when I'm editing. But uh, thank you so much, and uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch, of course. Thanks, Sylv. Cheers, mate.